I given this talk. I'm a member of the Council for Tall Buildings and Urban Habitat headquartered in Chicago. These are about uh, vertical cities and tall buildings. And in fairness to them, also last year I was elevated as a fellow to yes, two of us all over the world. The other guy was the builder of Burj Khalifa. So um, tall buildings had shifted from west to east. Until 1980, 80% of the tall buildings were in North America. But by 2020, 95% will be in Asia. So Asia ascending, Asia rising. And um, there are talks about um, the tall building typology that's now in Asia will address better the global urbanization. Nine billion population of the world by in 36 years, 2050. And 200,000 people a day migrate to the cities. And one million inhabitants per week migrate to the cities. So where's the best way to accommodate them? Urban sprawl or vertical cities? And, and this has been the debate. And it looks like tall buildings are even more sustainable than going sprawling. Um, maybe just a review of where we are. Yeah, I, I mentioned this in all my talks. If you rotate the map of the world, the Philippines is right in the middle. The past centuries, the center of trade and commerce was the Mediterranean. The past century was the Atlantic. And this century is Asia Pacific. And the Philippines is right in the middle. The shaded portions are the 38 countries that Palo Fox Associates has done work the past 24 years. And it's no wonder for 350 years, we were the Spanish European hub in the Asia Pacific. 100 years the Americans, 4 years the Japanese, 2 years the British. And Ferdinand Magellan, without a nautical map, about 500 years ago, 1521, he, he must have been brought here by the winds of Ala Yolanda, <laughs> right in central Philippines. And we're now number one in marine biodiversity, number one in the world. We're number one in voice call centers. Number one, sailors and seafarers. I'd like to believe we're also number one in musicians. Anywhere you go, you'll find Filipino musicians. We're now number two in BPOs, the third longest coastline in the world. Uh, Dubai, I was an urban planner of Dubai, had only 70 kilometers of waterfront. Sheikh Mohammed decided to do the Palm Islands to add 2,000 kilometers more of waterfront. Our waterfront is longer than that of the USA. Iraq invaded Kuwait because Kuwait is blocking the waterfront of of Iraq. Um, we have the number four in gold reserves, also number four now in ship building. We're number five in all other mineral resources, and number 12 in human resources. And the Filipino expatriate is the favored employee of kings, queens, sheikhs, developers, colleges, cruise ship, what have you. And the Filipino is supposed to be the best global citizen of the world, unfortunately, outside the Philippines. The Philippines is 400 times the size of Singapore, 350 times the size of Hong Kong, eight times the size of Taiwan, three times the size of South Korea. And from the 1930s to the 1970s, we we're number two in Asia, second only to Japan. That's why the rest of Asia, they thought Manila would be the highest development potential as a financial center. We we're competing against the Shah of Iran and Japan, the biggest contributor. Japan agreed only provided the president of ADB will always be Japanese. And what happened? Corruption, criminality, and climate change. We have failed to address this effectively. So hopefully between now and 2021, with the awareness that the corruption now will have better governance, address criminality and climate change. And Typhoon Yolanda has sent the strongest message that we really have to address uh, climate change, protecting and enhancing our environment. Just a quick review. Our first uh, exposure to Western town planning, Spanish uh, uh, loss of the Indies from King Philip II, which the Philippines was named after. Uh, our towns, just like Latin America, were supposed to have been planned in intramuros for the Ilustrados and the Principalia, the rich and powerful, extramuros for the peasants, the locals, the Chinese merchants. And if you look at our cities today, still the same. The gated communities, 
and the ordinary employees are outside. And one thing good about it, at least every Sunday, there was a town plaza, and it was inclusive. Regardless of income class, we come together as a community, at least every Sunday. And uh, 1905, Daniel Burnham, who planned Manila in, in, Bag, in 1905, in Baguio, in Chicago in 1905, he made the city, his inspiration was Paris and Venice. Paris, River Sand, Pasig River, the White Boulevards, the Canals of Venice, our Steros in Manila, and Manila Bay, the Bay of Naples. That was the inspiration. He was not even inspired by an American city. He looked at European city as an inspiration for the planning of Manila. And we followed the Burnham plan while the Americans were here. But when we became a Philippine Republic, we copied erroneously Hollywood and Los Angeles. We planned our cities not for the pedestrian, but for the automobile. And uh, again, back to the intramuros of gated communities. Metro Manila in year 2000 was the fastest growing metropolis in the world. 60 persons per hour. Delhi was only, is only 47 persons per hour. London, Paris, New York, I think about seven persons per hour. Moscow was negative two per hour. So year 2000, we are the fastest growing metropolis because of the primacy of Metro Manila. A primate city is 10 times larger than the second biggest city. So Metro Manila is 10 times bigger than, than Cebu. And the proposal is create counter-magnet growth centers outside Metro Manila. Maybe, maybe Metropolitan Dawag, Metro Vigan, Metro San Fernando, uh, San, uh, and so on, Batangas, Cebu, Zamboanga, Davao, and so on, to make them as attractive as possible. And around the Calabarzon and, and Central Luzon and the metropolis, interconnected with development corridors. So these growth centers, like Clark, can be a growth center as a counter magnet to attractiveness of Metro Manila. And this is a, a satellite picture of the Philippines. You can see in here, nighttime, only Manila is lighted. The rest of the country has no lights. So you can see the, the primacy again of Metro Manila. The Imperial Manila, the Cebuanos say. Yeah. And we talked in Clark two weeks ago about metropolis, megalopolis, aerotropolis, airport driven city. Somebody was reporting, I think it was Arnel Casanova, BCDA. His talk, I was pleasantly surprised. 62 or 63 percent of our GDP is attributable to our airport cities, cities with airport, despite the apologies, mismanagement of our airports. 62 percent of GDP goes to the airports. And from urban sprawl to com more compact cities, segregation to better integrated, from congestion to better connected. Let's plan in advance, plan in phases, plan at scale, plan for density, plan for energy, efficiency, and risk reduction, plan for connectivity with focus on the public space, the public realm, plan for social integration, proof work policies. This is uh, Metro Manila. The American Corps of Engineers, before they left, 1945, they had proposed that Metro Manila will imagine Metro Manila as a half a wheel with the Port of Manila. We have 10 radial roads and six circumferential roads. EDSA was going to be circumferential road number four, planned in 1945, built in 1954, 54 meters wide. That's why for a while they called Highway 54. And what happened along it? The central business districts sprouted. But this is how not to plan a metropolis. Because you have the concentration of jobs and economic activity surrounded by gated military camps and gated low-density neighborhoods. So that workers, employees of the central business districts, they spend 1,000 hours a year in traffic. Makati Central Business District, the daytime population is 11 times the nighttime population. So you have to bring in the 11 times population in the morning and bring it out in the evening. I think Ortigas is the same. There's a big imbalance between jobs and housing. Along Fifth Avenue, New York, Orchard Road, Singapore, uh, the middle of Paris, London, you don't see four families per hectare gated communities. You only see this density in the suburbs, not in the middle of the cities. So this is skyline of Makati, Ortigas, and Manila. So this is the big imbalance of the central business district 
with 11 times population during the day, surrounded by very low density gated communities. It's just like combining Fifth Avenue, New York, or Charlotte, Singapore, Nathan Road, Hong Kong, with Beverly Hills, Hollywood. So you can see jobs and housing, planning is balanced. So this is a big imbalance. So that when mayors from the provinces come to see us, they want to plan their cities like Makati, I have to explain. Mak Makati is a nice postcard, but this is how not to do it. And many scholars all over the world now, Metro Manila is an urban laboratory for lessons to be made from mistakes made. And best practices, they go to Singapore, Curitiba, Brazil, and so on. 100 million population, uh, majority urban. The urban growth of Metro Manila. Um, uh, these are the circumferential roads and ring roads. Uh, C5, C6 has not seen the light of day. It was planned in 1945, before I was born, maybe most of us. It's not yet there. And no one there, EDSA is always so congested because we don't have a hierarchy of roads. We don't have parallel roads. And if you have a hierarchy of roads on the major thoroughfare to the major thoroughfares, the hierarchy below the major thoroughfare, they are inside gated communities. So there are no feeder roads feeding into or parallel to EDSA because they are inside gated military camps and gated uh, communities. This is the old Manila, uh, Makati with the uh, Ayala's, uh, uh, currently McMaking, planning it, 1960, and present today. And uh, key issues in Philippine cities, sustainability, very high poverty rate. And I think we promised to the rest of the world with the Millennium Development Goals by 2015, we should have reduced our poverty rate to 15%. I think today we're still 28%. Rapid urbanization, uh, declining forest cover, citizen participation, and political will with visionary leadership. Tomorrow's success will depend on how quickly government, business, and civil society will improve collaboration today. How to address the problems? More inclusionary zoning as opposed to exclusionary zoning. Democratic architecture, ar architecture of humanity. Uh, these are the architectural activism that Richard mentioned. We don't call it pro bono architecture, but we call it architecture for humanity, architecture for the poor. Best practices like new urbanism, smart growth, inclusive modes of transportation. We're advocates for green architecture, urbanism technology, green interiors, and so on. And I think Chris, the next speaker, will more expound on this. And the people bottom line approach to development, social equity or people first, then planet Earth or the environment. Then we can talk about profits or the economic goals. And the UNESCO sponsored CITES conference last week, there was a presenter from Korea, Korea talking now about quadruple bottom line, spirituality. And as a member of the American Sub Architects, 10 years ago I had pledged that by 2030, the buildings and communities we design will be carbon neutral. So every five years, we self-monitor our results. There, there are about a number of architectural firms that had signed up. And again, one of my professors at Harvard used to tell us, this century will be a re-century. Reimagine, replan, re-architecture, redesign, re-engineer, redevelop, Renew, reduce, reuse, recycle, and hopefully we'll have urban renaissance. In the Philippines, the communities we plan, I require that every car you own, you must plant 10 trees. So take about 10 trees to recover the oxygen of the carbon monoxide per car. Elsewhere in the world, like Dubai, Saudi Arabia, Abu Dhabi, we propose 17 trees per car because they have much larger uh, shopping utility vehicles. And let's start creating and recreate the urban environment with best practices like smart growth, new urbanism, vertical urbanism, which will be my topic today, inclusionary zoning, mixed-use development, and multi-use. With green sustainable development principles, triple bottom line, public-private partnership, and the 23rd challenge that I gave you. And then with democratic architecture, architecture, activism, architecture for humanity. Uh, evolution of cities. Cities started as port-driven cities from the port. That evolved into railway-driven cities, then freeway or highway-driven cities. This century will be aerotropolis, airport-driven cities. And this, uh, this image is uh, DJ Elsin Clark. 
There are three kinds of infrastructure, progressive, soft, and hard infrastructure. Progressive infrastructure are international airports, international seaports, international schools, hospitals. Hard infrastructure, we know that. Roads, utilities, and so on. Soft infrastructure is more important. The ease of doing business. No red tape, no corruption. Give the permit in one day, not in six months, and so on. And there are 20 modes of urban transportation. Our ur transport policies in our country, we don't recognize walking as the first mode of transportation. Walking, bicycles, all of us are 100% Pedestrian. Once you leave your car, you're a pedestrian. Only 2% of Filipinos are car owners. And yet our transport policy favors the automobile. And we still have broken sidewalks or no sidewalks and no bicycle lane. The planning and good governance. I add here um, political will with visionary leadership, then good planning and good design, then good governance. You cannot go straight into good governance if you don't have political will. You cannot go into good planning, good design, if you don't have visionary leadership. Education and knowledge and mass public transit. This is the future of cities. Two-story residences in the city. In 1998, we had a conference in Boston for the American Planning Association, and the conclusion was, if you have a single family home in the middle of the city, you have a much larger carbon footprint. Because you're arrogating to yourself very prime urban land resources, you are preventing more families to live closer to their places of work, and you're encouraging more urban sprawl to encroach into the forests and the farms. So this is more of a European city. Like, you live upstairs, you work in the middle, you shop and dine on the first two floors. So vertical horizontal integration of jobs, housing, infrastructure, corridors, green space, and walkability for a sustainable community. So we, we should design on human scale, full use of urban services, providing transportation options, efficient use of land resources, conserve landscape, design really matters, provide choices and protect environmental resources. And let's promote pedestrianization for mixed use and multi-use developments, maximizing land values for priority areas and promoting sharing of infrastructure and providing attractive transition between land uses. Opportunity for railways, allow direct access, transit engaged development. I borrowed this term from the New Yorker city planner. It, we used to call it transport oriented development. In New York, it really transport engaged development. And the one on the left bottom, we were part of the design for the King Abdallah financial district in Saudi Arabia. They will have three levels of access. Street level access for a pedestrian and the beautiful cars. If you have an ugly car, you are in the first level basement. Then elevated walkways interconnected and elevated monorails connecting to all their buildings. And linear parks and public spaces. So we have good local uh, examples also. Rockwell Center in 1994, it was a brownfield. And I think with the benefit of good planning, good design, uh, this Rockwell today. And this we borrowed from building code of Singapore. You start harvesting your water from your roof, from within your property, and roads are supposed to be, the road cross-section of roads should be one-third for landscaping and trees, one-third for pedestrian and bicycles, and one-third for the moving traffic lane. I cannot understand why public works is cutting down 70-year-old trees on Mac Arthur Highway, because it was only designed by the road engineers. They did not involve urban planners, landscape architects, and so on. A research says that a 50-year-old tree, the replacement value is 9 million pesos for the oxygen it gave the past 50 years, for the water it held, the fertilizer it held, the beauty it gave planet Earth, and the traffic calming effect on the environment. Because our roads are designed by road engineers, they don't involve planners and architects and landscape architects. Let's turn your roof from a liability into an asset. You grow gardens, vegetables, and, and so on. Rainwater harvesting, bicycles as a major mode of transport. Uh, Mayor Bloomberg closed down Times Square Broadway for pedestrians. They widened the sidewalks and, and reduced the moving traffic lanes for bicycles and pedestrians. So that New York, the New Yorker now has a lower carbon footprint from the guys from Montana. And the guys from Montana, you buy a bottle of walk, you use your SUV. 
In New York, every time you move your car, $10. You park overnight, $70. So they really penalize the use of the car to make it more walkable. And Singapore, they need system. They will, Singapore will have potable water from this. Uh, and Venice elevated walkways, I don't know why we don't do this in this country. We have, we have so many flooded streets every year, why don't we have elevated walkways? Venice, even when it's flooded, there are a lot of tourists because they anticipate the height of the flood. Uh, Singapore, they're interconnecting buildings now. So if one building is on fire, you could just move to the other building. And Singapore, one of the a vertical city. What happened here is when 1946, Singapore, Hong Kong, and the rest of Asia, they went vertical urbanism, vertical cities. We went urban sprawl, a la Los Angeles. And these are Tokyo, Shanghai, and these tall buildings in Shanghai, they're designed to be energy efficient. And also the ones being done in, in Dubai and uh, like the, the uh, Burj Khalifa, it's energy devising and uh, energy saving devices and even uh, capturing the energy. Paris, London, we had a conference last June in London, integrating height and heritage. Before they wouldn't allow tall buildings in London, but the city planner of London, he explained to us, you can put a tall building provided you protect the visual corridors of the Big Ben Parliament and St. Paul's Cathedral. So they even influence the shape of the building so you don't block the views to the historical landmarks. And New York and Chicago and so on. So these are the tallest buildings in the world. But as I said, by year 2020, 95% of the tall buildings will be in Asia. In 1980, 80% were in North American cities. And the tallest building now is 828 meters high. That's in Dubai, Burj Khalifa. One under construction in Jeddah, Kingdom Tower will be more than one kilometer. And, and the one in Shanghai, Shanghai World, the financial center, it's very energy efficient building. So th these are the building locations. Uh, we have three kinds now of tall buildings. Tall buildings up to 200 meters. 300 meters above, it's super tall buildings. 600 meters and above, mega tall buildings. And the Council for Tall Buildings and Urban Habitat, we're the ones uh, designating the top, uh, the tallest buildings in the world. And th this is the Kingdom Tower in Jeddah. Uh, it's a secret yet, how many meters above one kilometer. Yeah, and Burj Khalifa, Dubai. It's the same architect, Adrian Smith and Gordon Hill. And Mecca Clock Tower Hotel in Saudi Arabia, the second tallest building. Taipei 101, uh, I think the third tallest building, but by 2020, it will be the 20th tallest building. It will be overtaken. The Shanghai World Financial Center in Shanghai, and Hong Kong, and so on. Uh, Petronas Tower, um, 2020, it will be, I think, number 20. Now it's the third uh, tallest or fourth tallest. And most of these tall buildings will go to China. Uh, will happen in China, the Middle East, Korea, and so on. So all of these are happening now. So let's say in Makati, that's what happened that we were the architects of the first five towers of Rockwell, the West Block, and the master plan. At least the West Block is 200 families per hectare. And some of the gated communities in Makati, four families per hectare, up to 10 families per hectare, which is more sustainable. Like Rizal Tower, Luna, Amalsoli East, Amalsoli West, and Hidalgo, 200 families per hectare, whereas the gated communities from four families per hectare to, I think, 10 to 15 families per hectare, which is more sustainable, the vertical urbanism or the horizontal. I think we'll have to go vertical. We can't afford with, with, with the very rapid urbanization. These are the, the tall buildings. Uh, some of the ones we designed ourselves, uh, the Five Towers of Rockwell. Uh, this one is in uh, Alcobar, Saudi Arabia. Um, Saudi Arabia and Vietnam, UAE, Makati. The proposed um, DBP building in Fort Bonifacio, uh, Pasha del Rio, and so on. Uh, Saudi Arabia as well. 
all in Saudi. This in Dubai, Jumeirah Beach. This one on the left was, we designed it, but it got caught with the financial crisis in 2007. 1.2 kilometers high, the one on the left. And the inspiration is an oil derrick. It's an oil platform. So all of these are about a kilometer high. Uh, Malaysia, uh, Khartoum, Sudan. We're invited together with Norman Foster to design this bank in Khartoum, Sudan. And the uh, investors are from Saudi Arabia. Uh, this is another new, new building that we designed for Dubai, uh, Hong Kong. And development is not worthy of a name unless spread evenly like butter and a piece of bread. Inclusive growth. And my favorite quotation from Daniel Burnham, he wrote this while he was planning Manila in 1905. Make no little plans. They have no magic to stir men's blood. Make big plans. Aim high in hope and work. Remembering that a noble logical diagram, once recorded, will never die. But long after we are gone, will be a living thing, asserting itself with ever-growing insistence. Remember that our sons and daughters are going to do things that would stagger us. Let your watchword be order and beacon beauty. Thank you very much. That was eight seconds per slide. <laughs>